We are ready. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for listening to me speaking in English. It is a great pleasure to return to Brno. I was last here in the year 2000 at a conference organized by a committee led by Professor Vladimir Schmeckel. And it's a real pleasure to come back. I had a moment of surprise. I thought, have I got this right? What I remember is a, an old building, concrete, not very comfortable, not very light. I could have known as I came on the tram through Brno from the station that things have changed here. This is a new building and I sense in the streets, in the clothing of the people I meet, in the way they talk to me, not just new buildings, but a new spirit. And I am here partly because that new spirit faces new challenges. We in London have lived with increasing diversity for a very long time. London, you will see, is in the southeast corner of the United Kingdom. It is the gateway to the rest of Europe and the gateway in the past for the rest of Europe to come to the United Kingdom. London has been increasingly more diverse ethnically and in terms of the languages people speak, changing rapidly since the end of the First World War. Those of you who have handouts will have some statistics which support that uh, contention. London is more diverse than the rest of the United Kingdom. This chart shows you the pattern of ethnicity in London in 2011, when our last national census was conducted. On the left-hand side of the chart is the proportion of people marked in purple who are classified, who classify themselves ethnically as white British. And you will see that in London, that group now constitutes less than 50% of the population of our capital city. On the, as you move to the right-hand side of the chart, you will see that significant proportion of the minorities come from countries which were part of the old British Empire. We are diverse because we have a colonial past. But you will also see that there is a large group in the middle of the chart, colored orange, dark orange. My color names are not very good. I, I hope I'm not presenting you with a problem. 
a substantial group in the middle are described in the census as other white. And a large proportion of those are people who are new to the United Kingdom and who themselves or their parents or grandparents came from other parts of Europe. Like the Czech Republic, we are open to movement across Europe and we have increasing numbers of um, new migrants. What I will share with you today is the learning journey of psychologists working on psychological assessment in the London context. I am not here to tell you how I think it should be arranged or conducted in the Czech Republic. After one day in your country, I don't think I have been here long enough for that. But I believe that you can learn from seeing how we have learnt. Your, the destination of your journey in psychological practice will not, I am sure, be exactly the same as ours. But looking at the lessons we have learnt on the way may help you to consider the lessons that you, as a community of psychologists, must think about. I know from my visit 15 years ago that there were already then major challenges from diversity for psychological assessment. There was a long history of psychologists playing a role in the impact of general social expectations on the Roma community. I am sure things have improved since the 1960s and 70s and 80s. I am also sure that if your community of psychologists is like our community of psychologists, there is still a long way to go in the journey. Let me share some of the thoughts about the journey that we have. First, I want to look at the challenges that face psychologists and other public servants. Challenges to the assumptions we make about what is stable and universal in human society and human behavior and human performance. Challenges to the ideals we have of fairness and equity in our work with our clients and challenges to the arrangements we make for the delivery of services, including psychological services. First of all, the assumptions we make about what is stable and universal. And I will take an example from psychometry. At least I will try if I can follow my own notes. Ah, oh, yes. I hope this is familiar to everyone in the room. The block design task has been current in psychometric history for over a century. We continue to use it in many psychometric instruments today. And another task which has a long history is the task which examines a person's ability to conceptualize a picture or graphical representation as a whole. What is missing? from these pictures. 
the assumptions we make as we go on using these tasks, <clears throat> and in some cases, go on using these same materials, the assumptions we make include that the abilities that are involved in succeeding on the tasks are stable and remain the same over time. But what happens when culturally valued objects change? Reflect on the cultural knowledge that is involved in answering the question, what is missing from these objects successfully? We all have equal opportunities to learn about shadows that are cast by the sun. But what about rabbits or playing cards? We make an assumption in the practice of psychometry that the norms of performance will remain stable and that the cultural values and ideas and understanding associated with objects and ideas will remain stable. In 2015, neither of those assumptions is safe to make in all circumstances. There is also a challenge to ideals of fairness and equity. How can we operate as psychologists in a way which does not operate with bias against some uh, of our clients? How can we operate in a um, way which is fair and equitable to all? I have put on this slide four elements of the process of psychological assessment. And in each of these elements, there is the possibility of something going wrong in terms of fairness and equity when a psychologist meets a client from a minority ethnic or linguistic community. I have already talked about the second bullet point the content and style of assessment materials. I have referred briefly to the problem of maintaining norms in a changing society so that what was gave the basis for a valid prediction of future performance in the past will continue to give the basis for a valid prediction of performance now. we will all be aware of the possibility in my final bullet point, the interpretation and use of test results being influenced by the psychologist's individual biases and areas of cultural knowledge and ignorance. <clears throat> and we will be aware of the pressures, institutional and organizational pressures, on psychologists to interpret and use psychological test data in ways with which they may not always be comfortable. Let me for a moment turn back to the first of these bullet points. The interaction between the interviewer and the client can be conceived simply in psychometric terms. The psychologist offers a test stimulus. The child responds. The psychologist or teacher measures the child's response. That does not seem an adequate model of what happens when a psychologist or teacher meet a child 
in a test situation. A psychological model would consider what meaning the child attaches to the situation. When they are tested, will they understand the implications of the test and of the situation? Will they feel confident or intimidated by the uh, context? The child makes sense of the task and the teacher or psychologist makes sense of the child's understanding of the task, a psychological model. But that too seems not to capture the full psychological <clears throat> situation. We need to recognize that this is a social situation. It is an interaction between people in a particular cultural and social context. The child compares the situation they are in with other familiar, familiar situations like it. And for some children, that is the basis of understanding and confidence. And for others, it may be the source of anxiety and concern and uncertainty. In a culturally diverse society, a social psychological model of the psychological assessment situation must lead us to have a fuller understanding of the challenges we face in responding to children and clients from minority groups. There is also a challenge to the delivery of services. And I'm not in a position to talk uh, about how that may impact on psychologists in the Czech Republic. But there is one aspect to this which is shared by psychologists all over the world. This is our training. And what you have on the slide is a sentence from the list of requirements of basic training, which the British Psychological Society sets out, in this case, for educational and child psychologists. There are similar criteria for the training of other applied psychologists from the society. Notice that what is required is that psychologists are prepared with the knowledge, awareness, skills and values that will enable them to work effectively with a diverse client population. If we are to have adequate delivery of services, it needs to start with the basic training and the continuing training of the professionals who work in those services. <clears throat> what can society expect of the assessment process? The assessment will <clears throat> offer theoretical integrity, the model of personality development which lies un underneath the assessment strategy that is used will incorporate all aspects of development. Historically, there were... Um, many examples of psychological tests and scales which failed to explore all aspects of personality that are involved in learning. It will be 
practically efficient. It will show practical efficacy. For example, it will draw on the richest sources of information possible, not just how the child performs or operates or interacts in a, an isolated clinical situation with one other person, but how the child performs in other natural, everyday settings alongside other children, with other adults, with adults from their own community, for example. It, society will expect of us that the assessment process will show equity. Among other things, the rights of children and parents will be effectively protected and the process of our assessment will operate without bias. And how will we know if that's the case? We will know because of the fourth bullet point. We will know that these things are the case if there is accountability. If the process and the information it produces is transparent and open to clients, parent, children, parents, other professionals. Incidentally, in our list that we prepared under this heading, we had another one. Is the process cost effective? We all live in economically difficult times when public services and human services are under pressure financially. It is no good doing a Rolls-Royce job, a luxury car, famous in the UK. It's no good doing a Rolls-Royce job if you have a mini budget. The mini was a very small car in our country. I want to now move to the finer points of assessment and I'll be referring in some detail to functional assessment and we'll describe that in a moment. Many of you will be familiar with, of course, psychometric standardised assessment and with variants such as dynamic assessment and criterion referenced or curriculum related assessment. For now, I want to look at the bigger picture functional assessment. And this slide draws on the work of colleagues in the Educational Psychology Group at University College London, Jess Dewey and Sandra Dunsmuir. We conceive functional assessment as looking at the learner in context. And it explores the functional relationships between the pupil, the task, and the instructional environment. At the center in pink is the learner. They have their own individual characteristics. This circle is associated with assessment which is focused on the learner individually, assessment that asks the question, what is this person like? There is then a middle circle, which in Vygotsky's terms is likely to include the zone of proximal development. It is the area around the child in which we examine the relationship between the learner and the tasks they are set. Tasks they're given in school or in the consulting room of a psychologist. I have already referred to diagnostic assessment and curriculum related or criterion referenced assessment, which are in that circle. And I want to draw your attention to the outer circle where we have the micro level of the classroom and the macro level of the school and home and the links between them. These areas have been ignored by many child and educational psychologists in the past. Those of you who are not working with children and in educational settings, please forgive me, all my examples will be taken from these because that is what is familiar to me. But I have every reason to suppose 
that the lessons we have learnt in educational psychology are true for many other areas of applied psychology as well. <clears throat> in an overall functional assessment, the psychologist needs to judge the impact on a child of the micro and my macro environment. And I suggest that that may be particularly important in societies that are ethnically or culturally diverse. The main message of the diagram, then, is that a full functional assessment should incorporate all three circles, the learner, the task, and the environment. So functional assessment focuses on three fundamental fun uh, functional relationships between learner characteristics, task dimensions, and the wider instructional environment. So it takes account of the cognitive psychology of the child, the social psychology of the task, and the instructional psychology of the school curriculum. In this way, it addresses learning, not only by looking at the learner themselves, as in most traditional psychometric measures, but it looks further afield. It analyzes and aims to adapt a range of features and facets which may help or hinder learning. In doing so, it has an interesting potential, which I suggest may be relevant to developments which I, understanding are, I understand are occurring here in the Czech Republic uh, at the moment. When the response to children with special educational needs becomes more inclusive, when more children with different needs are being educated in mainstream classrooms and mainstream schools, a strategy of assessment which examines the relationship between the learner and dimensions of the tasks they are set and between those and the broader instructional environment, that kind of strategy deals with what can change. I will have black hair until it goes grey. Well, it started to go grey. It is something I have inherited and cannot change. Luckily, it doesn't matter. But there are things I have inherited and cannot change which probably do matter. My doctors take an interest in the history of heart disease among men in my family. I can do nothing about whatever genes I have which probably make me vulnerable to the things that go wrong for men as they get older with the functioning of the heart and the circulation of the blood. I can, though, do something about the environment I provide for the care of my heart functioning. It is within my control. I have to tell you, I don't do everything I should, but I do do more than I might. The important thing about functional assessment in relation to children with special educational needs is that it is optimistic. It looks at what we have the power to change. And it looks positively about how children may be enabled to learn even 
when their characteristics suggest that they may face many challenges. So I want to just briefly mention the kinds of inquiry that a psychologist might make to examine the context within which the child they are meeting is um, starting their test encounter. And I'm going to take as an example something which is very pressing for us in the United Kingdom and may perhaps be of relevance for you uh, here. For us, this is the presence in our schools of an increasing proportion of children who are learning English as an additional language. English is the language of the school, and they learn it as a second or third language after learning a different language at home when they were very young, the language of their parents or grandparents' country of origin. And this list of questions is about the child's history. There are questions about history which a psychologist will ask of any client when they are involved in psychological assessment. It is always relevant for monolingual or bilingual, UK or overseas immigrant clients. It is always relevant to find out about their hearing and their vision and their medical history. But for children in our country who are learning English as an additional language, there are specific questions which we need to satisfy ourselves that we understand. And I have suggested some of those questions on this slide. The questions that will be relevant in exploring the background history of a bilingual child in the Czech Republic will be different. The important point here is that questions of this kind and that an inquiry of this nature is essential if one is to understand the performance of the child and make predictions from it. When we're working in schools, we also need to know about the classroom and the school, and about its response to the diversity of children who are there. And those of you who are interested in emotional aspects of learning will notice the last bullet point in particular. Children will respond differently when they know that others set a value on them, or the opposite. I want briefly to move to the outer circle of my uh, slide and consider the learning environment. We can evaluate it by observing it, And we can evaluate it by exploring how pupils perceive it. We can use multiple measures and something, the fourth bullet point here, I won't be talking about, but which you can explore if you're interested in a textbook I shall be mentioning at the end, soft systems methodology. Observation measures have the advantage that they're an effective way gathering detailed information directly about the how the child is interacting with the whole classroom environment. Never when you uh, prepare notes for a lecture, save paper, because you lose your way when it's double-sided. Observation makes it possible to examine 
the teacher's expectations of the tar target child in practice, what they actually do rather than what they hope they do or tell you they do. It's possible to collect verbatim records of what the teacher, the ch target child and other children actually say to each other. There are limitations. The observer can affect the context. People act when an observer is visibly in the room. But with children who have learning difficulties, we have found a particular observation schedule useful in laying the basis for designing appropriate interventions. <clears throat> this is American. It's a classroom observation schedule developed by Hirsch C. Waxman. And it records key aspects of the classroom env learning environment with a focus on an individual pupil. You can see the major headings on the slide. I would suggest that the headings, though not the detail of Waxman's schedule, would be relevant in different education systems. The trouble with finding out what's actually happening in the classroom is that that is not the only factor that affects children's learning and performance. Crucially also, what matters is how the child interprets and perceives what occurs. We need to have strategies for finding out from pupils how they see their teacher, their classroom, the tasks they are set. And a useful inventory that I'll mention today was developed in Australia by Fraser. The My Class Inventory is the version for younger children. And it enables you to examine how cohesive children think a class group is. And social cohesion matters a great deal in a ethnically or linguistically diverse class group. If you talk to children about their school, ask your own children tonight, the first thing they will tell you that matters is not what they learn, not what they think of the uh, teacher, not what they think of the environment. It is their relationships with friends. It is their peer relationships that matter. Cohesiveness is important, and I would suggest it's particularly important for children from minority backgrounds. You can see, I hope, the relevance of other um, headings there. <clears throat> so I have talked about the challenges we face in a multicultural, multilingual society in undertaking psychological assessment, what society can reasonably expect of us how strategies of functional assessment can enable us to meet those expectations, what background knowledge we need when exploring the ability and performance and making predictions about the future of individual children from minority backgrounds. And I have considered two possible approaches to evaluating their learning environment. I hope the organisers will allow me to do an advertisement. The third edition of a textbook that my colleague Nora Fredrickson and I have produced over the past 15 years, Special Educational Needs, Inclusion and Diversity. The third edition will be out from McGraw-Hill Publishers later this year or early in the new year. So there's my advertisement. But I'm if there is time, I'm not sure who to look at for this, I would be delighted to take any questions or comments briefly from you. And I will be around later in the day and will be pleased to engage 
with individuals about individual queries, if you wish. But if anyone has any question for me, I'm happy to um, respond. I am told there are five minutes, so there's good time for discussion. I've got my timing wrong. Open to you. One moment, please. Děkuji. Nevím, jsem slyšet často? Už? Halo, halo. Thank you. Thank you for a, a question which raises very important and fundamental issues. I am grateful to you. I will not try to talk about the latest version of the DSM manual. Many of us think that the purpose now of the DSM manual is to make it possible in the United States of America to operate insurance schemes that facilitate the payment of uh, psychologists and psychiatrists, and it is not any longer designed to enable serious psychologists to understand different human beings. So let me put that to one side, but I want to take up your very important question of culturally appropriate assessment materials. What on earth does that mean? There was a test developed in the United Kingdom in, I think, the 1960s. It may have been the 1970s. And it was called the culture-free intelligence test. The idea was that we could use materials and tasks which were culturally neutral. And that if we did that, we would be fair to people from diverse backgrounds. It was a noble aspiration. And it was deeply wrong. We live in a culture. We need not culture-free assessment, but culturally enriched and embedded assessment. We need to be able to make predictions about how human beings will perform in an actual society. So the first problem with the idea of culture-free test materials was that they were trying to do something which isn't very helpful. But there was another problem. This was the problem that no materials 
perceived and interpreted by a child or adult can be free of their cultural upbringing in the way they interpret it. If I look at the lines of the block design test, I will look differently if I am a West European or Central European child who has played with bricks that look a little bit like that during my childhood. If I am from one particular group in Central Africa who in the past lived in a constructed, a built environment, which had very few straight lines and corners and a lot of curves and round walls and roofs, I will find it difficult, more difficult, simply because I have not been exposed to the perceptual experience of a child growing up in a built environment like ours. It is not possible, as well as not desirable, it is not possible to create culture-free test materials. So that brings me back to the phrase you quoted, sir, the phrase from the manual published recently, culturally appropriate materials. The first thing, and I will concentrate for the moment on the materials, the first thing is that there must be some familiarity. I was consultant to a group of private schools in the United Kingdom who were selective. Only children who passed a test could go to them. And many parents wanted their daughters to go to these schools. And the schools were accused of discriminating against children from a South Asian background. Because in some towns where there were many South Asian families, including well-established and prosperous families, middle-class, elite families, their girls were not passing the test to get into the school. So, with colleagues, I looked at the test materials they used, and I just want to give you one example from it. There was a question that the children had to write an essay about. And they had a choice of questions. And one of the questions was, how I care for my pony. A pony is a small horse. And historically, for middle class English girls, the relationship with a pony was a close one. Some of you may have learnt some English reading girls' stories about ponies and competitions and rivalry and tension. This perfectly reasonable choice of essay topic had been on the test for more than 20 years. But during that time, fewer girls in English cities were in a situation where they had a relationship with the care of horses. And in particular, some communities had no tradition of this. South Asian families would have looked with absolute astonishment at the idea in the uh, early period of their settlement that one would keep something as expensive as a horse and find great value in looking after it. The point I am making, sorry, it's a long story. The point I'm making is 
that the a culturally appropriate test needs to make sure that the references and the objects in the test are equally familiar to all the children who may, or clients who may take the test. We should avoid something which favours one group rather than another group because of its content. So culturally appropriate materials will have had their content evaluated. And we would advocate that evaluation will take place with an advisory committee which includes people from the range of communities that are represented. We ask people, will this work for your children? Notice what I'm also describing. Psychologists are being humble. They are saying, we may not know what is culturally appropriate. We need advice from people in different communities to help us. The second set of questions will be about the tasks themselves. And let me take one example, and I should probably uh, finish then. I will take one example from the history of psychometry. Psychometric psychologists have often needed to measure performance in a situation where they're interested not in ever-increasing complexity and difficulty, but measuring the completion of a task of equal difficulty by speed. How fast can the child or the client perform this task? Timed tasks have a long history in our activities. That's fine. If you understand the rules of the game. But some children will come from communities which have a more relaxed attitude to the exercise of time than those of us in Northern Europe do. They will not demonstrate their abilities by going quickly. They will demonstrate their abilities by getting things right. If you ask people in different parts of the world what the word intelligent means, in North America, it will almost always lead to a list of words which includes something like fast thinking. In parts of China and Africa, it will almost never include that phrase. There are cultural differences in the way in which the tasks we often use will be interpreted. So, how can I answer my friend who asks about cultural appropriateness? I would suggest that the best answer is a process answer, not to be definitive. It means this and this and this, but to say we will know what is culturally appropriate in our society when we have involved articulate members of all the communities who are going to be the subject of the assessment in evaluating the cultural appropriateness of the materials. It's a challenging task, but we will learn a lot from it. Thank you. <laughs>